I've actually been playing the GameCube quite a bit recently because I am in the process of moving house and this is the only retro console that I actually still have here and I still have all of my games as well so I'm really excited in this video to tell you 15 of my personal favourite games for the system. Let's get started. This video is brought to you by Bifrost Bridge Studios. They're a transmedia narrative company that's creating a board game, a card game, and a graphic novel, all based around this concept of Gaia's Seed. If you're interested in finding out more about the game element, I actually mentioned it in last week's Game Boy Homebrew video, so go and check that out if you want to see more. Now, on with the episode. So, game number 15, I'm sure a lot of you have played this one, especially in multiplayer, this is great fun. This is Time Splitters 2. I was actually around a friend's house the other day and we actually played this in 4 player and that was the first time I'd played it in multiplayer for many, many years and the memories just came flooding back. This game is so fast paced, it's so over the top, but as well as a really cool multiplayer mode, it also has a really good single player story mode as well. And the reason that this game is so good and so well polished for what it is, a lot of the people who worked on games like GoldenEye and Perfect Dark actually left Rare around this time and went to form their own company called Free Radical and they actually made a game called Time Splitters for the PS2 which was very basic and then a year later they made the sequel Time Splitters 2 which came out on the PS2, the GameCube and the Xbox and it is a fantastic sequel, a really well polished game and I really hope that the Time Splitters series makes a comeback soon. There are rumours going around so fingers crossed it does happen. Number 14 was kind of an experimental game from Sonic Team, one of my favourite game companies. A lot of people don't really like this game much and it does get very frustrating later on. I'm talking about Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg. I personally absolutely love this game. I played it all the time back when it came out. I was just obsessed with it. I loved the cute and colourful graphics. I loved the opening and the amazing theme tune that it had and the whole game was just so much fun to play. Up until the last world anyway and then it does get really really frustrating. But I went back and played it a little bit to capture footage for this video and I still love it just as much today as I did back in the day. I remember as well it also came out on the PC a few years later and I actually installed that on my laptop in college and I remember one lunchtime I actually played all the way through using the keyboard on my laptop and I was so excited to be able to play it on the go as well. It's such a shame that Sega never made a sequel to improve on some of the problems that this original game had but it does make it a really unique one-of-a-kind experience and it's something that any GameCube owner should try at least. Now for this next game I kind of struggled to decide which one of the two games from this series I was going to include in my top games list but in the end I went for Star Fox Assault. I think it's the more replayable game and that's why I chose it instead of Star Fox Adventures. I think in terms of actual quality of the game Star Fox Adventures is the better game but in terms of games that I've gone back to and played more I would give the edge to Star Fox Assault. It is kind of a follow up to the N64 game so if you didn't like the fact that Adventures was sort of a Zelda clone, this one is a lot more familiar to the traditional Star Fox experience. It does have on foot sections as well and it does have some tank battles which I personally really enjoy. I also love the graphics, I think they did a great job making it feel really atmospheric and it was a really cool arcade experience all the way through. I also really, really love the soundtrack for this game. It's fully orchestral and it just sounds incredible. Definitely one to check out if you like Star Fox games and I know not that many people have actually played this one. Even if it's not one of the best games in the series, it's a hell of a lot better than some of the games that came after it. Now for a multi-format game, but one that I really loved on the GameCube back in the day, this is possibly my favourite entry in the whole series and it is a really long running series. I'm talking about Need for Speed Underground 2. If you've played it you know exactly why I picked this game out of any of the other Need for Speed games. This was the first one that introduced an open world rather than individual racing tracks. I loved the customization, I loved the career mode and the sense of progression that you got throughout the game by buying new cars, doing them up in the garages and then going out at night and finding all these different challenges. The graphics were really cool at the time, all the lights shining onto the road and the shine and the reflections and everything. It had a really cool soundtrack 
and I just loved exploring the city. I remember me and my friend at school, we would talk about all the different places that we'd found in the game, and there was one section of the city that I really remember enjoying. You come off the highway and you go around through an airport, and you can build up loads and loads of speed. It was so much fun to just go around in a circle like that and not really even worry about the career mode. Of course, there was a lot of games that came since, but even so, this is the one that I have the fondest memories of, and that's why I included it in this list. Now, this next game is a prequel to the game that's given Duke Nukem Forever a run for its money. Of course, I'm talking about the original Beyond Good and Evil by Ubisoft, and what an incredible adventure this is. Just like Need for Speed Underground 2 that came before it, I have fantastic memories of talking about this game with my friend Jack back at school. We played this game through together. I think he had it on the Xbox and I had it on the GameCube, but it's basically the same game no matter what system you play it on. Characters are amazing. The world and the graphics and the atmosphere, everything about this game is just so good. I also love the photography aspect of it. And coming off the back of Wind Waker, which I will get to a bit later on, don't worry, it is coming. Coming off the back of Wind Waker, this just felt like it was a much more mature third-person adventure compared to the kind of cartoony Zelda game, which is still a brilliant game, but I did really enjoy this at the time, and I really hope that the sequel lives up to everyone's expectations. I can see why they're taking so long, because this game is so good and so well-loved by so many people that it's going to be really, really hard to top it. Now, this game, just like Need for Speed before it, I had to pick one game from the series because this is one of the games that defined that whole era of games for me and the one I went with the one I've probably put the most time into and the one that I have the fondest memories of this is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. I really loved this game back in the day I know I'm gonna say that about all of them but I really loved the Tony Hawk series in general not just because the gameplay was fantastic and it controls super well but it also introduced me to a lot of my favorite music back in the day as well if it wasn't for games like Tony Hawk's and Need for Speed I wouldn't have even known that I enjoyed the punk rock style music that these games featured so heavily. As well as the main game, I also really, really loved the skate park creation modes in these games. I spent so many hours building really elaborate skate parks, and it's thanks to games like Tony Hawk's that I went on to study game design at college and university afterwards. So thank you, Tony Hawk's, and I really need to get around to buying the remakes of 1 and 2 soon as well. That one looks brilliant. Now a game from another series that was also really popular around the same time as Tony Hawk's. I really struggled whether I should pick the third game or the second one for this entry, but I went with the second game and that is SSX Tricky. I'm sure a lot of you know that this game has a really good reputation and it definitely deserves it. This is such a, such a fun game and I actually want to do a revisited retrospective on the whole SSX series at some point in the near future. It was one of the first videos that I ever did and I really want to go back and revisit all the games and I feel like making a video would be a really great excuse to go back and play them all again, starting right from the beginning and working my way all the way through. Even though the game has many, many sequels, I do think that SSX Tricky is my favorite of the bunch. It's so over the top. I love all of the crazy level designs. I think because it's not an open world like the later games, they could really go all out with the insane levels in this game, and it still holds up really well today. I was playing it to capture footage for this video, and the animation is so fluid, it still controls really well as well, and it's such a shame that this series is no longer around. I would really love for them to make another one. I actually really miss the EA Sports big brand in general. They had such fun games at the time. Now, I can't believe I got this far into the video without actually mentioning a game made by Nintendo, so let's change that now with one of my favourite games that Nintendo has ever made, and certainly one of their most unique. I think you just saw it then. I'm talking about the original Pikmin. It was such a unique concept at the time, I'd never played anything like it. And it's such a shame that it's only ever had three real entries in the series, because I really think they could do a lot more with it, and I really hope they make a Pikmin 4 in the future. I know I keep saying it, but I just loved how unique this game was. I'd never really played an RTS before, so this was kind of a really nice introduction to that style of game. 
and I just loved the level designs, the layouts. I love the little fact that all of the textures for the world were actually taken from Shigeru Miyamoto's garden. I just loved the design of the Pikmin themselves. I loved the music. I just absolutely love this game. I didn't really like Pikmin 2 as much as the first one because it introduced dungeons and it actually got rid of the time mechanic, which I know a lot of people don't like, but I think that's one of the things that makes Pikmin 1 in particular so replayable. And that is the fact that you only get 30 days in order to try and complete the game. So you really have to think about whether you want to try and sacrifice some Pikmin to pick up a part a day earlier, or whether you want to try and spend a day to gather more, and then maybe try and get two the next day. And I also love that at the end of the game, the final level is really like a big gauntlet, and it's a really difficult challenge. And it's something that you've had to learn all the way through the game in order to build yourself up, in order to actually beat it. So that's one of the reasons why I picked Pikmin 1 over Pikmin 2. Let me know in the comments which one you prefer. Of course, no GameCube list would be complete, without Smash Brothers Melee. I used to play it all the time with my friends back at school. They would always come round to my house after school and we would play this for hours and hours. I remember unlocking every single character. I also think this one has a really good classic mode where you collect different trophies at the end. I played it through with every single character and I had my whole like table that you unlock in the game full of all of the different trophies and of course I really love all of the Smash Brothers games but this one holds really good memories and I know a lot of people still think that Melee is the best in the series because of how fast it is and how responsive the controls are as well. And of course another game that I also really enjoyed playing in multiplayer with all my friends after school, of course this is Mario Kart Double Dash. Quite possibly my favourite Mario Kart game in the entire series. I love the courses in this one, I love the fact that it's 60 frames a second even in 4 player, which even the Switch game isn't, I actually found that out the other day, when we actually started playing Double Dash and then we switched over to the Switch, no pun intended, and the game actually only ran at 30 FPS instead of 60, which was really weird. Although, going back to Double Dash now after playing some of the more modern entries, the controls take a lot of getting used to. I remember at the time I really loved the controls, but going back, it feels like you try and steer one way and the cart wants to at first go the other way and then start turning that way, which is really strange. It's like they're really like wavy in the way they control, which is really weird. I don't remember it being like that. Maybe it was just the cart combinations that I picked. But even so, absolutely love the game. I love the swapping the characters mechanic so you can hold two items at once. It was a really fun way of saving items for later on in the game. Although, of course, in single player, the game can get very frustrating. And before we move on, there's one other thing about the single player mode that I have to bring up. And of course, when this game came out, what, 2003? Yeah, 2003, I would have been 11 years old. So anything that I read online, of course, I thought was true. So I saw a rumor on Game FAQs back in 2003 that said, if you complete the single player Grand Prix mode, not just with every single character, but with every single combination of characters, you could actually unlock the N64 courses, which of course was a complete lie, but at the time I didn't know. So I actually had this spreadsheet that I'd printed out and I had every single combination of every single character and I would play through this game. I've probably played this game like a hundred plus hours by now because I tried to complete it as every single combination of characters in order to unlock the N64 courses. And of course that never happened, but because of that it did make me play the game a lot and that is why it's one of my favourite games in the series. Let me know in the comments if you've ever fallen for a rumour like that. Now for by far the most impressive game on the system, this was made by Amusement Vision at Sega along with Nintendo. Of course I'm talking about F-Zero GX. What an insane game this is. Coming from F-Zero X on the N64, just the jump in quality between the two games is just mind blowing and it really put into perspective at the time how much more powerful the GameCube was compared to the N64 which I'd had beforehand. I'm a huge fan of the F-Zero series in general and it is so sad that this is the final console entry in the series. This came out I think in 2003 as well, the same year as Mario Kart, and I can't believe that it's been nearly 20 years 
since the last F-Zero game. What a Nintendo playing at! We need a new one. Although, to be honest, playing it for capturing footage for this video, it still holds up really well today. But maybe that's more telling of the lack of progression in games in the past 20 years than Nintendo's actual willingness to make another entry in the series. Let me know in the comments what your favourite F-Zero game is. I also love the fact that there was also an arcade version of this as well, and I was really, really lucky one holiday that I actually found the arcade game as well, F-Zero AX. And there is actually a way of taking the AX courses and playing them on this. Of course you can do it now through an action replay, but at the time you would actually have to take your GameCube memory card and put it into the arcade machine to transfer the different courses and the different cars, which I thought was a really nice idea, although I don't really think a lot of people had the chance to actually try that back in the day. Now for a game in a series that I've got progressively, unfortunately, less and less interested in as time went on and as new entries kept coming out, but at the time when the first one, for the West anyway, came out on the GameCube, I absolutely fell in love with it. Of course, I'm talking about Animal Crossing. I actually got to first play this game at an event called GameStars Live. In fact, I actually played this game for so long at the demo booth that one of the people actually came over and gave me a free t-shirt, which I still have to this day somewhere. But yeah, I'd really never played anything like it and it was such a unique experience, kind of like what I said about Pikmin. I remember whenever I would go and stay over at my nan's house, I would actually take the GameCube over there and I would stay up all night after she'd gone to bed and carry on playing Animal Crossing. And it's still my favourite in the series to this day. I think it has some of the best music. I love the kind of weird quirky realism to the graphics and the kind of strange psychedelic atmosphere that none of the games later in the series really recaptured for me. There was just something really special about this one. Let me know what your favourite Animal Crossing game was. Did you start with the first one and work your way through the series like I did and become less and less interested as less and less new features were added to each instalment and you'd kind of played them all to death over the years? Or are you someone who started a lot later, maybe on the 3DS or maybe even more recently with the Switch one that came out last year? I'd be really interested to know where you got your start with the series and how you feel the series has progressed over the years as well. Of course, no Nintendo top games list would be complete without a Zelda game and of course the GameCube has two fantastic entries in the series but the one that I chose for this list, mostly because I played Twilight Princess more on the Wii than the GameCube, this is Zelda The Wind Waker and not just The Wind Waker, I'm also including in this Ocarina of Time and Master Quest as well because when you got this game at launch you also got this special disc here which included Ocarina of Time and a remixed version called Master Quest and believe it or not this disc here was actually the first time that I ever finished Ocarina of Time. I never actually finished it back on the N64 and the GameCube one was a little bit better. It had a slightly higher resolution and a slightly smoother frame rate but of course the star of the show is Wind Waker and what an incredible game it is. At the time I had never played a game with as much freedom of exploration as Wind Waker and I also really really loved the graphics and the music. I know the graphics were at the time kind of controversial but I think over time people have really grown to love them and it really does stand out. And as well as the graphics just being really nice and colourful, they've actually really held up to the test of time really well too. I really think the cell shaded look gives it a really timeless feel. And of course, the HD re-release on the Wii U was also fantastic and it improved on a lot of the problems that this original version had. But even so, at the time, I overlooked any issues with the game. And if you want to know more about my thoughts on all of the Zelda games, I actually did a Zelda retrospective earlier in the year. So go back and watch that. I'll put a link in the description or you can click the I in the corner there as well. Two games left now and they're both Sega games. Of course, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you'll know that this game was bound to appear somewhere. I'm talking about Super Monkey Ball, a launch title for the GameCube and still probably the one game that I come back to more than anything else on this entire list. I absolutely adore this game. It's quite possibly my favourite game that Sega has ever made. It is just arcade perfection. And I really can't wait for Monkey Mania to come out on the Switch very soon. If you want to know more about my obsession of Monkey Ball, I actually did a really, really in-depth two-part series at the start of last year. 
So I'll link to that down below. It's really well worth a watch. I still think it's quite possibly the best video that I've ever done. So definitely go and check it out after this. And the final game, and I had to put this at number one because this is by far the game that I've played most on the GameCube out of any game in my entire collection. And quite possibly one of the games that I've played the most in general. This is Sonic Adventure 2. And this was my first introduction to the game as well. It was the game that I got on launch with the GameCube. And kind of a sad story to round this video off, when the GameCube came out, of course I couldn't just afford to buy it like I could with all of the later Nintendo consoles. So what I did at the time, which I really regretted after, but what I did was actually sell my N64 and my entire complete in box game collection to go along with it, just in order to buy the GameCube and Sonic Adventure 2. So one of the reasons that I love this game so much is just the fact that I had nothing else to play. So all I did was sink all of my time back then into this one game. I put in like well over 200 hours. I was trying to get all 180 emblems because if you don't know about this game, you can actually unlock a 3D version of Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1, which is a really, really cool unlockable, and I wish that a lot of later Sonic games had actually added something so substantial to try and aim for, but unfortunately they don't. But I love the fact that that was part of the game, but to get it, you had to 100% complete the game, which means getting A ranks on every single level. And if you've ever played the game before, you know how much of a struggle that is. Well, I'd got to about 160 or 170, and then, because I was using a third party memory card, all of my save data was wiped, and I lost all of my progress. Like, over 200 hours of gameplay, I was just so, so, so upset. But that still was a really nice memory of trying to do that. And I've tried many times since then to try and go back and get 180 emblems, but I've never managed to do it. So let me know down in the comments if you were ever crazy enough to attempt to get 180 emblems in Sonic Adventure 2. Let me know some of your favourite GameCube games down below. If you'd like to support the channel, check out Patreon. You can also join as a channel member. I actually just recorded a behind the scenes video where I go into how I've got this video set up. So if you'd like to show me some support, you can go and do that. Please leave a like if you enjoyed it and I'll see you next week for the next episode. Goodbye.